Hello, everyone. Let's continue. Now we'll talk about the shell model. So the shell model. So um, we talked about the electron and these energy levels in the periodic table, and it turns out that we can represent each row on the periodic table as a shell, and each energy level as a shell. And within those shells, there are specific orbitals that make up the shell called slope shells. Okay. So we um, based on this ionization energy data, we can um, we can conclude that electrons are attracted to the nucleus more strongly as the charge on the nucleus increases, and less strongly as the distance from the nucleus increases. Right. So that's kind of the two trends we're going over right now. So if we compare hydrogen helium, we see a two time increase in energy. But if we compare hydrogen and lithium, we see about a two and a half decrease in ionization energy, despite the increase in nuclear charge. So it kind of tells us that these electrons are being added to different shells of the atom. So there's, um, so unlike what we previously thought about the electrons, they're not all, you know, in the, they're not all located in the same place around the atom. So they don't all feel the same force of attraction. Um, as other electrons and earlier elements do, okay? All right, so what does this mean? Well, it, it tells us that um, we, um, so what this means is that the electron um, was removed is further away from the nucleus um, if we compared lithium and helium, it kind of suggests that the electron is now further away from the nucleus in lithium than it was in helium, the valence electron. Okay, so it's easier to remove if it's further away, and um, we can suggest that electrons are arranged in specific shells. So let's look at lithium's shell. So on the right here, we see a, a shell for lithium. And see, there's the inner shell for the n equals one shell, and then for lithium, we enter a new uh, energy, new shell or new energy level, and that's that's where the the third electron goes. Okay. So since that's further away from the nucleus, um, it's going to feel a less attractive force or positive charge from the nucleus, and thus it's easier to remove. Okay. So. Um, so working very um, at the beginning here, we see that hydrogen and helium, they consist of a nucleus surrounded by a shell of either one or two electrons in that shell close to the nucleus. And we'll go into why we, we can say there's only two electrons or three electrons and so forth. Okay. So lithium though, it's, uh, it has two shells, right? One that's close to the nucleus and then another shell that's further away. So, um, well, this information, we can say that lithium contains two electrons that lie relatively close to the nucleus of the atom in the same shell, as the same electrons um, in hydrogen and helium. And then it has one additional electron in the shell that's further away. So um, we can call the two, the nucleus and the two inner uh, electrons, they constitute the core of the lithium ion atom, okay? So, so when that happens, um, the electron in the outermost shell doesn't feel the full charge on the, from the nucleus. Um, it doesn't feel a plus three charge, but rather a charge that is reduced by the core electron. So this is called electron shielding. So this may be a familiar term. Um, basically, advanced electrons um, in elements um, down the periodic table, they experience shielding from the electrons from the lower energy levels. And that what causes the decrease in ionization energy. Okay, so we can define the core charge or the charge felt by electrons that are further away from the nucleus. Um, so this is just a technique for organizing properties, and it doesn't really reflect the actual charge felt it by the outer shell electron. So it's just a technique to kind of determine that lithium feels a charge less than than hydrogen and helium because it has a uh, it has a lower effective nuclear charge or what we say um, core charge. 
All right. So we take we take lithium, we take the nuclear charge, and then we subtract the um, we take the nuclear charge, then we subtract the number of electrons that are below that are shielding the electron from the valence electron from the nucleus. So in this case, we have two electrons in the 1s orbital that are um, negating the plus three charge and overall we get a plus one charge from the nucleus that's being felt by the electron in the outermost energy level okay so since the, um, the electrons are at a greater distance from the nucleus it experience a smaller attraction for the nucleus than the helium atom so it takes less energy to remove that electron so that's why we see that trend in ionization energy where it drops dramatically from helium to lithium Okay, now let's look at beryllium. Beryllium has an ionization energy of 899, which is larger than lithium's. Um, and that reflects the trend we see, right? The increased charge on the core. So I believe this should be two. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think. Um, No, this should be three. My apologies here. Okay, sorry. This should be three, not plus one. I guess I copied and pasted the wrong number. So it's um, boron has a uh, a plus five nuclear. Uh, oh, sorry. This is for really not boron. What am I talking about? Okay. So beryllium has a plus two core charge, not a plus one. Okay. And we see that, that the core charge then is going to be larger for beryllium than lithium. That's why the ionization energy um, is larger than lithium. because the core charge will increase, okay? And then if we use that same kind of analogy here for all the other elements, um, we see that for lithium, for boron, we go to plus six, a uh, plus three, sorry. And then oxygen plus, um, plus six for oxygen and then plus eight for neon. And it's according to this equation because um, all these elements are in the second energy level. So um, the amount of, en uh, amount of energy they experience for removing an electron is going to be determined by this equation, the nuclear charge minus the two inner electrons from the one, one uh, n equals one energy level. And so that's why we see those, um, those numbers there. Okay? Okay. So now let's calculate the core charges for carbon and fluorine. So carbon. So for carbon, we have a plus six nuclear charge, right? Because there's six protons on carbon. Looking back at our periodic table. And so for carbon, um, then it's going to be the same because carbon and fluorine are in the same energy level as the rest of these elements we just talked about. So it's going to be plus negative two. Inner electron charge. Equals plus four. Core charge. And then we have fluorine here. Which is, has a um, atomic number of ten, uh, nine, sorry, and then we'll have the same um, inner electron, inner electron charge, because it's in the um, second energy level. And when we do that, it will have an even higher core charge, and that explains the trend in ionization energy. So in this case, it'll be plus seven. And that makes sense because oxygen was plus six. And then neon's plus eight, so fluorine should be plus seven. Okay, 
So that's how we kind of explain the increased ionization energy. Um, the, the differences between the N equals one level and N equals two, and then the increase, general increase in ionization energy as we increase the atomic number. Okay. All right. However, now when after the eighth electron has been added, there is another significant drop in ionization energy like we saw oops, in our picture. In our picture, um, in our graph here, right? So we saw the dip here. We go from neon to, to sodium. Right, there's a big drop there. And that's because we're entering into a new energy level, okay? So why does this data Okay, apparently I can't English no more. Why is this data? Why is this data not consistent with having nine electrons in the second shell of sodium? So why isn't this consistent? Well, there's two ways we could think about it. Let's talk about the first one. So number one, the, the first ionization energy. of sodium is much less than the first In the first ionization energy of neon. Right? So that's one thing we should point out, right? Now, if there were, were nine electrons, if there were nine electrons in the second level, but we know there, there's not, right? Because in the last last chapter, we, we said the first level has two electrons. The second level has um, eight electrons. Okay. So um, what was the trend? It was, um, I think it was, um, I think it was two, no, what was it actually? Let me see. Um, what was the trend in the last one? How many um, electrons can be in the energy levels? We went over this. So, um, ah, so remember for, for um, um, we can find how many orbitals are in each energy level by taking the principal quantum number and squaring it. So when we take two, the second energy level, we have four total orbitals. And then remember each orbital can contain two electrons and that will give us a total of eight electrons. So the second energy level can only have eight. Okay. So if there were nine electrons in the second, in the second, in the second level, we would expect Okay, we would expect these electrons to be held more tightly. By the 11 protons. In the nucleus of sodium.
and the eight, the eight valence electrons, and then the eight valence electrons. Are held held more tightly than then the eight valence electrons are held by D ten by D ten by the ten protons. by the 10 protons in the nucleus of neon. Okay, if that were true, this would give sodium. A larger first ionization energy. Then neon. Rather than the observed. Smaller ionization energy. Okay, so the fact that we don't observe this kind of proves that um, there's there cannot be nine total electrons in the second energy level. So we could use this data to really kind of explain um, how these electrons are arranged in the atom. So that's pretty neat. Okay. So here's the energy level for sodium, the shell model. See in the first level, we have two electrons, eight electrons in the second, and then the ninth electron will go into the third principal energy level, N equals three. So this trend continues until we reach potassium. So it goes all the way. Um, we add eight more electrons in the third energy level here. So I'll highlight it right here. See there? And then it seems like we only have an s then a p orbital as well in the um the third energy level so then we get to the fourth energy level where we see another sharp decrease in ionization energy as we go from argon to potassium so that suggests we entered a new uh shell the fourth shell okay like so so um, what can we take from this? Well, many of the trends in the ionization energy are reflected by the structure of the periodic table. So if we kind of pull up a periodic table, all right, maybe I should pull up the periodic table now and explain a few things here. Okay, let's see. So let me just um, get a periodic table here. Okay. Okay. All right. Reference. That's perfect. Okay. So let's exit out here and go to a PR table. Okay. So if we go to the periodic table. All right, so let's look at our periodic table. So you see here the first energy. So we can label these. Um, we can actually label these um, periodic tables um, with the um, energy levels. So, so we go to the first call, first row. That's n equals one. That second row n equals two. Third row n equals three, and then the fourth row n equals four, and so forth. N equals five. N equals six. And n equals seven. So the highest energy level energy level we know of to the to this day is n equals seven. 
So in the first column, this is where we get the S block. So these two columns right here, so these two columns are the S block. So you ever looked up uh, electron configurations, hydrogen, um, this is what we call the S1 block, and this is the S2 block. So if you're in group two, you have a filled S orbital. So for example, magnesium would have a valent, uh, so magnesium would have a electron configuration of, um, it has a neon core, so it has all the electrons up to neon plus um, 3s2. Since magnesium is in the third energy level and it's in the second block, it gets the s2 notation here. Okay. The p block right here is the um, the p block is this group here. Remember the p block has three orbitals, so it has a total of six electrons it can fulfill. And if we count from boron, we get one, two, three, four, five, and then helium six. So this is. Maybe don't put the six there. So this is the P block. So we can have, so the P block starts at the N equals two level right here. So this will be two P, three P, four P, five P, six P, seven P. And then for the S block, it starts at 1s. So n equals 1, that will be 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, 6s, 7s. Okay? So um, the structure of periodic table actually reflects the structure of these the electrons that we've been seeing in the ionization energies. So then now we get to the transition metal block. So this block which consists from this group here to here, that's called the D, uh, the D block. And you see the D block starts at 3D. So we get scandium would be um, 3D, yttrium would be 4D, and then we would get first, um, so when we get to the, um, so then um, hafnium would start at the 5D level, and then uh, Ruffer 40M will be the 60 level. And you see now there's a cutout here in this area here. Okay, so you see this cutout and it goes to the, the, the table below here called the actinides and lanthanides series. So this is, so, um, so um, the D block starts at 3D, right? But then if we go to a new set of orbitals, so you see how we went from 1S, that's the S block, and then when we go to the second energy level, we get a new set of different type of orbitals, the P block, right? So um, so each time you kind of go to a new energy level, you're getting a new layer of orbitals. So it's kind of like peeling the layers back of an onion. You're gonna see more layers than ever before. So um, as we go to the third energy level, we're gonna get access to the D block now because it starts at the D block and then Lo and behold, when we go to the fourth energy level, we're going to see a different energy, um, different set of orbitals, and that's that's where the 4F block begins. So this is what we call the F block, the F orbitals. So lanthanide would start at 4F, and then actinide, which starts at the, which is arranged after the 7S block, will begin as 5F. Okay, and then um, if we go to the n equals four, you know we should also um, or n equals five, we should see a we should see now some g orbitals. That's possible. So um, after s and p, it starts to go more alphabetically. So d, we kind of skip skip e, then f, then g, then h. But there's no element to this date that um, that has electrons in orbitals higher than F, the F um, orbitals. So, um, so it's still, um, there's, there's just no, been, no discovery of any other elements so far. You know, but who knows if we visit Mars or the moon, maybe we'll discover some new elements. So it's kind of exciting to think about uh, space exploration in that regard. But that's pretty much how we see the periodic table arranged. So, um, 
Just remember, S can have values from one to seven. Um, D can have value, um, the D block starts at the dirt energy level, 3D, and can go up all the way to 60. And 2P, um, the P block starts at two and can go all the way up to seven on the PR table. And then the F block can only start at 4F and typically we only see up to 5F, but the numbers can go up. So, you know, D block can go past 60. Um, the S block can go past seven. The, and the P block can go past seven as well. So the only, the, the important part is where it begins. So S, one, P starts at two, D, three, and then um, four is F. And then it can go um, onwards um, for, um, uh, um, for higher energy, uh, for higher principal energy levels. And then G would ideally start at five. H would start out at six, and then if there was an I subshell, it'll start at seven. Okay, so it kind of gets incremented. You see different types of orbitals be possible as you increase as you as the energy levels from the electron um, of the atom increases. Okay, so that's my discussion on um, the periodic table. So we'll talk more about this in discussion, talking about electron configurations um, in the weeks to come. Okay. So now let's um, let's pause there, and that'll be the end of this lecture. And I'll see everyone in the next one. All right, see ya.